bow the knee, to believe the one who holds eternity, but he didn't. And we are in John chapter 13, so if you take your Bibles, turn with me to John 13, as we work our way verse by verse through this beautiful gospel, the revelation of Jesus Christ, his ministry, his death and resurrection here, coming up, John 13. Quite possibly the most shocking text of Scripture. Maybe the most tragic in all of the Scriptures. Let's pray and we'll continue our study in the Gospel of John, chapter 13. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for the opportunity to sing praise to you. Oh, the wonderful hymns and songs of the faith and the beautiful special music has, has stirred our, hope, our hearts, I, I, I pray. Um, Father, if, if we are not moved by singing truth to you and about you, um, then we need something radically done in our hearts tonight, Father. If we are removed from worship, if we are simply sharing things with our lips, but our hearts are far from you, we, we cry out and want your help tonight. We do not want to fall into the trap and snare of the devil, which Judas wholeheartedly walked into. Oh, Father, thank you for your grace and mercy, your love that to the very end, to the last moment, there was an opportunity for Judas Iscariot, but he did not bow the knee. He did not humble himself. He did not believe. He did not trust the one who holds eternity. And so I pray, Father, that we would take heed to this message. Help us to understand truth, to understand the, the message of the text. And then, Father, to obediently apply it to our life day after day, week after week. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and your mercy. All things through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. John 13 is in the upper room. It is the evening before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Within 18 hours, Jesus will be dead. His, his body cold, wrapped in linen cloths, lying in a tomb. The disciples, they have no idea it's Last Supper. No, they have no clue. They, they've enjoyed dinners with the Lord for th over three years. Week after week, month after month, they have no clue this is the last meal they'll ever have with Jesus, well, that they'll have with Jesus in his pre-cross ministry. They're, they're just thinking, Passover, unleavened bread, on and on, feast of first fruits, we're going to have a blast, and then it's going to be summertime, and we're going to be able to travel and preach and teach. They have no idea that shortly they will see Jesus Christ humbled, nailed to a cross, paying for the sin of the world. The scene is the upper room. Some man with a water pitcher over his head walking through the streets owns this house of which Jesus and his 12 have, have gone up into the upper room to remember the Passover. Judas Iscariot, as you know from Matthew 26, two days before, having seen Mary break that beautiful flask of perfume and waste what he thought was a waste of 300 denarii worth of perfume, uh, Judas, from that point on, sought opportunity to betray the Lord. He had already bargained for the murder of Jesus. 30 pieces of silver, which, by the way, Exodus 21 says 30 pieces of silver is the price for a servant who has been gored by an ox. Exodus 21, 32. If you have a servant and a neighbor's ox gore your servant to death and puts a big hole in his side with its horn... That neighbor owes you 30 pieces of silver. Jesus, his life was worth the price of a, of a servant with a, a hole in its side. And isn't he the servant of the father with a hole in his side, having accomplished the, the payment of sin on the cross? Judas is a murderer, and he's set up this whole scheme, and he's just been waiting for an opportunity. And had he known the address of the upper room, he would have had the Romans and the Jewish guards. He would have had everybody flooding that room that he could find to arrest and to deal with this Jesus of Nazareth. What a cold heart. What has happened in the text? Jesus has just washed the feet of the disciples, including Judas. 
the grimy, stinky, smelly feet has, have been washed and dried by the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory. And he has commanded us that he has given us an example that what he has done, so we should do likewise. We are to demonstrate love to one another. We are to, with action, demonstrate not just with feeling and emotion or word, but with deed. We are to love one another. He says in verse 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And Judas is listening to this. He could right now break down. He could humble himself. He could burst into tears and say, Father, forgive me. Jesus, I am a, I'm a murderer, and I'm going to, I was going to betray you, but I've changed my mind. I want redemption. I want freedom. I want forgiveness of sins. But he doesn't do that. So now we're going to begin in verse 18, and we'll make our way all the way to verse 30, and I will give you two applications at the end. So let's begin in verse 18. Jesus continues, having now washed the disciples' feet. He's back at his place. Uh, let, me, let me share this with you before we actually get into verse 18 so you can kind of get a picture of the scene. You have known from our Passover seders up here on the front platform, I normally have a, I've lately have been having the U-shaped table for the Passover seder. It is called a triclinium, and that is what the Romans, during the Roman period, they would have sat around a U-shaped table as the 12 disciples. Leonardo da Vinci has the great masterpiece, right, The Last Supper, and everybody's at a straight table in front, and you have Jesus in the center, and they're all seated in chairs. That is not the way it would have happened biblically. In order to make sense of the text that we're about to read, here is the upper, this is what the upper room might have looked like. You have here um, a U-shape triclinium, tri meaning the three-sided three -side, three table. They would have reclined on pillows, and they would have been laying and stretched out here, laying on the pillows. And I believe the, the setup of the Last Supper would probably have John, the apostle right here, the, the host of the feast would be second, right here. So you have the youngest right here, you have Jesus right here, and the most honored guest out of the group would sit to the left of the host. So I believe it would have been John, Jesus, Judas, and then the other nine disciples. And probably the Apostle Peter, way on the other side. Probably over here someplace. He could have been here, but I just can picture it in my mind over here. But regardless, we know for sure these three, John, Jesus, and Judas, are sitting side by side. Judas having the seat of the most honored guest. Why? Jesus knows he's a betrayer. Because Jesus, out of great grace and love, is trying to win and to humble and to break the hard heart of Judas, even to the last moment. So Jesus says in verse 18, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Jesus says, not all of you are clean. And, he, and then he even goes on to say here in verse 18, now, he is not speaking to all of the disciples at this point. There is one who is a betrayer. And he quotes a great psalm, Psalm 41, verse 9, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Everybody turn to Psalm 41, verse 9. This text was written 1,000 years earlier, 1,000 years prior to the scene that we're reading. David writes this psalm, Psalm 41. Here's the picture of David. David's son Absalom has committed treason against the king. David is the king. His son has committed treason. His son has stood outside the gate of Jerusalem back 1,000 B.C., and he has told everybody, hey, my, old da my dad, the old man, he's crazy. He's bonkers. You don't want him as king. You want me as king, his son Absalom. Not only am I gorgeous, I can give you lower taxes, free college, free food. I will make sure that, hey, you never have a problem in your life. My old man, man, he is off his rocker. Trust me, vote for me, and sure enough, Absalom takes over the throne. One of David's most trusted counselors, his most trusted counselor is Ahithophel, all right? An older man named him Ahithophel. Ahithophel's granddaughter is Bathsheba. So David's most trusted man in his government has a granddaughter, Bathsheba, whom David commits adultery with and murders Bathsheba's 
husband. So Uriah and Ahithophel have a close connection, and Uriah's dead. So Ahithophel no longer has great love for his friend David. The scene in Psalm 41 is a, is a sick bed. David is in a hospital, not a hospital, but he's, he's laying in bed, and he is probably in and out of consciousness. Whatever disease, whatever sickness he has is bad. And he has around his bed various people, like you would at a hospital, right? And as David is lo looking around and he's hardly able to, to, to concentrate, he notices a, a by his bed are his enemies. So listen to how this goes. Verse four, Psalm 41, verse 1. Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. Look at verse 3. This is why I think it's on a sickbed. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sickbed. This is David writing. I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. My enemies speak evil of me. Listen to what the enemies around the sickbed are saying. When will he die and his name perish? David's laying in bed. Somebody's like, man, when will this guy die that he may perish? Look what else it says. And if he comes to see me, he speaks lies. His heart gathers iniquity to itself. When he goes out, he tells it. Verse 7, all who hate me whisper together against me. Against me, they, they devise my hurt. An evil disease, they say, clings to him. And now that he lies down, he will rise up no more. That's what they're saying, maybe around the bedside. Good. David's got an evil disease. Let him die. I hope he dies right now. I hope he doesn't make it through the night. But who's actually saying this? Look at verse 9. Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted. I think this is Ahithophel for David. It is Judas for Jesus. My own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread. By the way, if you're eating bread together, you're close. You're having fellowship. You're enjoying one another. You share a lot in common if you're eating a dinner. By the way, you don't normally sit down and eat dinners with your enemies, do you? You never call them up, hey, I know you hate my guts, but hey, would you come over and share a meal with me? You'd never do that. But those who you really love and love you, you get together for meals. They, he ate my bread. Has lifted up his heel against me. You know what it means to lift up your heel? I think we should know. It's a pretty common phrase. For those in the agricultural um, or the animal, uh, you know, that type of, of land, you're milking a cow. If that cow begins to lift up its heel, what's it going to do? It's going to kick you. If you're shoeing a horse and that horse begins to, uh, you can see that heel going up, what are you going to expect? You're going to expect that it will kick you. And if it kicks you, severe harm. Severe, severe harm. So here, David's best friend, his most trusted companion, who he ate bread with, he went to worship with, is the one that has kicked up his heel to kick David down in his, in his time. And this is 1000 B.C., and Jesus says, Judas, or he's telling the group, the betrayer is going to fulfill this scripture of lifting up his heel against me. Judas heard the word of God from the lips of God, right? In Luke 9, verses 1 and 2, Jesus gave power to all 12 disciples, it says. You can check Luke 19, Luke, I'm sorry, Luke 9, 1 and 2, Jesus gave to all 12 disciples power to heal all diseases, cast out all demons, and to preach the kingdom of God everywhere. Judas, listen, Judas has followed Jesus, listened to him, watched his miracles, heard about the transfiguration. He knows Jesus is God. He has seen it. He has preached the gospel of God the gospel of the kingdom. He has been given power by God, even though he's an unbeliever. He has been given power as one of the 12 to heal every type of disease and cast out any kind of demon. And I believe Judas had gone around village after village, casting out demons, healing diseases, and yet he has not placed his trust in Jesus Christ. Isn't that sad? Instead, his heart is so cold, he is so far from Christ, he has set up a plan to murder Jesus, to have him arrested and ultimately turned over. Why doesn't Jesus just, like, kill Judas right now? Why doesn't he just take him out of the picture? 
Because the Bible says Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save the world. The time for judgment is later. Now is the time for grace and for forgiveness. Go back to John chapter 13. So we see an ancient prophecy fulfilled as Judas is going to go betray the Lord. Psalm 41, verse 9. Now, verse 19, now I tell you before it comes, he's telling all the 12 disciples, and Judas is listening. Judas is listening to this text of betrayal. Verse 19, now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am. Jesus is saying, I'm going to tell you ahead of time that I'm going to be betrayed. Why? You, listen, everybody. If Jesus doesn't tell them ahead of time about his betrayal and even give a scripture reference to prophesy it, when the betrayal actually happens, what would, the, what would the other 11 disciples say? They'd be saying, wait a minute, Jesus is God and he missed this big thing? How could Jesus miss this? He, he, maybe he's not God. If he's a prophet, he should have a little more discernment to know that one of the guys in his group, his most inner circle, is going to betray him. Jesus, well, he can't be God because he didn't see this thing coming. God would know everything. God, you know. So Jesus says, I'm going to tell you beforehand so that when it happens... You will realize it wasn't an accident. It wasn't a surprise. It, it didn't catch me off guard, but I knew even in eternity past that this event would happen. Listen, the deity of Christ is of greatest importance in our doctrine. We have to believe in an er inerrant word, a word without error, preserved for us, and we have to believe in the deity of Christ. So Jesus is saying in this verse, I want everyone to know that I did this willingly. I allowed myself to be betrayed. I allowed myself to be arrested. I allowed myself to be scourged and beaten and hung on a cross so that I might willingly pay for the sins of the world. So he is truly God. We can never lose the truth of the deity of Jesus Christ. He is the I am. Look at verse 20. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. There's only two types of people those whom God sends out for ministry, and those who do not even know him. And if you receive a messenger of Jesus Christ, you're receiving Jesus Christ and the, and the Father. And if you are not, like Judas, although he's sent out, he is not from God, and so he is not from the Father, there's only two groups of people. And so Jesus is saying, the, the divide is clear. Judas is not one of us. He's going his own way, and he's going to do it quickly. Verse 21. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit, deeply, deeply troubled in spirit. His insides hurt, were wrenched apart. Why? It could be that he was troubled in spirit because of the cross. Having to pay our sins, uh, he's going to see that cup of sin and in the Garden of Gethsemane sweat great drops of blood, but, uh, but I'm not sure that that's why he's troubled in spirit right now. He, l listen, the text of Scripture, here's what the Bible says. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. I think what troubles him in spirit is that Judas is unsaved. Judas has walked with him, ate meals with him, and is still unsaved and will not respond to truth. He will not respond to the glory of God. And so what troubles Jesus is that he is he has done everything he can to win the love of Judas, and Judas still is rebellious and will seek to kill and, will, and seek to turn him over to the authorities. So Jesus says, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Look at verse 22. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. All twelve. Looking around, going, What? One of us, one of the twelve who, who we've been together for almost three years, one of us is going to betray you and hand you over to the authorities? And they are perplexed. Take your Bibles. Go with me to Matthew 26. Look at Matthew 26, and you'll see another alarming statement. Matthew 26. Let's look at verse 20. Matthew 26, verse 20 says, When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, and here's the corresponding text to John 13, Assuredly, truly, truly, this is guaranteed, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? They're going right around the group. Is it I? Lord, one of us? Is it, is it me? Is it me? 
Uh, is, it, is it I? Um, he, goes on, he goes on to say this. He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Verse 24. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? Judas knows it's him. And he's going to Jesus, looking at him, in, looking in his eyes, looking at his face, and says, uh, Lord, is it I? Like all 12 of them are doing it. And Jesus said to him, you have said it. And now remember, they're close by, so Jesus could talk to Judas, and nobody else might hear it because they are so close at the table. Can I say that Judas is the greatest hypocrite? You know what a hypocrite is? It is a stage actor. It is one who puts a mask on their face to play a part, and then they can put another mask on and play a different part. Judas is, has played the part. He has played the part of a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus. He has done the things and said the things that would be expected of a disciple, and not one of the 11 suspects Judas. They have absolutely no clue what, go, what is going on in the cold, dead, unsaved heart of Judas. And it is possible that somebody could sit in church year after year after year after year, hear the gospel, do the things, say the hymns, teach the Sunday school. They, they could, there are pastors who are preaching the gospel week after week after week with unge- unregenerate hearts. There are. And they are absolutely the best hypocrites because nobody knows what's going on in their heart. They are playing, they are, they are playing a great act. They are acting in the Christian stage, and nobody can tell there's a difference. This is Judas. Back to John chapter 13. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. That would be John. So John is laying down. By the way, when you're laying down, you're laying on your left elbow because you eat with the right hand. The right hand is the hand of honor. The left hand is the hand of dishonor. It is the hand that you would clean yourself with. Um, It is the hand that, that you would never shake. So the left hand was never used for eating. You would be reclining here on the pillow on your left elbow, on your side, and then you would reach over to the table and you would use your right hand to eat. So John, laying down there on his left elbow, could simply lean his head on Jesus' chest because Jesus is leaning the same parallel way. And so the text says, there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, on his chest, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Now, Peter wants to know which of the 12 is going to betray Jesus, right? They know, now they know there's a leak. They know there's one bad guy in the group of 12. Peter is motioning, which means he's probably away from John and Jesus and Judas, and he's motioning. You know Peter. He's like, John, John, John. He's motioning, and, and John gets it. Well, why does Peter care? Why does Peter want to know? Here's what I believe. I believe Peter wants to know the name of the betrayer so he can kill that guy, I believe, take that guy, hold that guy, maybe even kill him before he gets out of the upper room. Does it make sense? Now, Luke 22, verse 38, says in the room, in the upper room, there's not only 12 disciples and a table like this, not only are there pitchers and pans and a basin of water for the foot washing and towels, not only... Um, Are there candles to light up the room at night? Luke 22, verse 38 says there are two swords in the room. Because Jesus says, as they're getting ready to leave the upper room, find whatever weapons you have and collect them. And the disciples said, we have two swords with us tonight. Jesus says, that is enough. So they have two swords. I think Peter's like, John, find out who it is. I've got the sword. We'll kill him before he leaves here. Can you imagine Judas? Judas? Jesus has now said, one of you will betray me. Judas knows it's him. His heart has got to be beating fast. And he's like, oh no, what if people find me? What if they find out these 11 will never let me go? By the way, do you want to know one of the 12 disciples' names? Simon the Zealot. Do you know what a zealot is? A zealot is an assassin. A zealot means one who is zealous for the Jewish faith. They hate Rome so bad, they were undercover assassins. 
Simon the Zealot, in his old life, pre before he became a follower of Jesus, probably had a small sword always on him, and if there was a Roman senator or, a, or an important Roman, he would be assigned, go kill that guy by, by tomorrow night. And Simon the Zealot would go and assassinate people. I mean, Simon the Zealot would have no problem putting a knife in the betrayer. Neither would Peter. We see Peter's action in the garden, right? He cuts off Malchus's ear. Well, Peter wants to know who it is, so verse 25, and then leaning back on Jesus' breast, John said to him, Lord, who is it? <laughs> Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. We know that the bread was dipped in the haroset, the mortar, the apple honey um, nut mixture, to picture the mortar of the bricks in Egypt. And so Jesus takes a piece of bread, scoops it into the haroset, and that was always given to the most honored guest. If you, were given to, if you were given it first, it meant that the host really appreciated you, really loved you. He hands it to Judas, who is right next to him. Having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Even here, he gives to Judas Iscariot the greatest honor and the greatest grace, doesn't he? He's showing again, Judas, would you trust me? Judas, will you believe in me? Verse 27, now after the piece of bread, so Judas eats it, and it goes down as esophagus. After the piece of bread, Satan entered him. This wicked, rebellious angel actually goes inside the body of Judas and possesses, like a demon possession, he possesses this man called Judas Iscariot. The Bible says Satan, as, as far as we know, will only indwell two people. Number one is Judas Iscariot, and the second one is the Antichrist. The Antichrist, Satan will enter and use the Antichrist in the future one world uh, global rebellion against Jesus. So now Satan has entered him. Then Jesus, and Je does Jesus know this? You bet. Jesus is God. He knows the invisible. He could probably even see Satan in the room. Next thing you know, Satan's inside Judas, and Judas is taken over to absolute, absolute wickedness. Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. Because they're side by side on this end of the table, nobody else is hearing all the conversation. So all they see is Judas getting the sop and Jesus saying, whatever you do, go do quickly. And Judas gets up, scot-free, and walks out of the room unharmed. No one at the table knew why Judas would get up and go quickly. Verse 29, some thought, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why Judas might get up and leave having the financial box, which they completely trusted him with. Verse 30, and, and having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. Now, whenever John uses the phrase, and it was night, like he did in Nicodemus' case, it's not only the idea of physical darkness, it's the idea of moral spiritual dark or moral um, spiritual darkness. And it, it is dark outside. Passover always takes place at a full moon. It is always at a full moon, but maybe the clouds were blocking it. It was night. At least we know that the sun had set. And as dark as it is outside, it is even darker inside the heart of Judas. What can we learn from this? Let me give you two applications now. The first application. You can live near God's presence and not be changed by his power. You can live near God's presence and not ever be changed by his power. You can come to a church where the Holy Spirit is working. You can even critique and figure out, hey, who is the Holy Spirit using? where are the spiritual gifts operating, where are the salvations happening. You can live near the presence of God and yet never have the word of God and the glory of Jesus Christ affect you or change or transform your heart. There are many unsaved people sitting in our churches that have never responded to the truth. They are stage actors. They are hypocrites. They're leading one life that is totally removed from what Jesus Christ 
is in his glory, just like Judas. And you can't tell the difference. It's wheat and tares. They're in the same church. Wheat and tares look the same. The only way you ever get rid of the tares is in the harvest. So where are you at spiritually? When you hear the word of God, is it affecting you? Is it changing you? Are you responding to it? Listen, are you different spiritually than you were a month ago? Are you differently even, even than you were a year ago, Christ-likeness-wise? I mean, if, if you're not seeing a pattern of growth, we, growth is evident. How do we see growth? Fruit of the Spirit, right? Fruit of the Spirit is, is something physical. Fruit is something we can see. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. If you're not more loving, if you're not more joyful, if you're not more peaceable, if you're not more long-suffering, if you're not gentler, if you're not kinder, if you're not with more self-control than you were prior to this day, well, then you're not growing spiritually. And listen, if you're not growing spiritually, you're not staying plateaued. You're regressing. Your heart is getting harder and harder, and the light is dimmer and dimmer, and you're turning yourself over to wickedness. It's, it's just the truth. If you do not respond to the word of God, if it is not affecting your heart, you're not just staying status quo. Your, your heart, like the book of Hebrews says, is getting harder and harder, and the light is dimmer and dimmer. Hebrews 3.10 says, in that whole text of chapter 3, three times it says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as it was in the days of the rebellion. That's a warning to believers. He says in Hebrews 3, 3 verse 10, Beware, brethren, lest any of you, believers, lest any of you depart from the living God in unbelief, your heart will harden through the deceitfulness of sin. So if you, if you, don't, if you don't soften your heart and allow the word of God and the life and the glory of Jesus Christ to change you, then the Bible says you are getting hardened in the deceitfulness of sin and unbelief, and this is for a believer, and, um, and you are literally like Judas. Although you're saved and you're eternally secure, there's, there's tremendous lots of rewards. You can live near the presence of God and yet not be changed by his power. You know the number of defections in our faith on a, like a big Christian world spectrum? A lot. There's musicians. There's pastors. There's people all over abandoning the faith of Jesus Christ. Why? Can I say this? It didn't happen overnight. It did not happen overnight. Judas, he doesn't just wake up on the day of the Passover feast that they're having, and he's like, oh, what should I do today? Oh, I think I'm going to brush my teeth. I think I'm going to walk around and get some exercise. I think I'll betray the Lord, too. Ah, make it a day. No, this happened long ago. So that brings me to my second point. My second point is this. When sin is tolerated, the light of God in our life uh, grows dim. I keep thinking of that analogy of light growing dim or the sword being dull. But if you, are, if you tolerate sin in your life, you're doing what, what Judas did on his path. He was arrogant. He was greedy because he stole from the money box. And he never dealt with it. He just tolerated those sins. He never dealt with it. He never saw himself as a sinner against a holy God in, in need of a savior. He never placed his faith in Jesus Christ. Instead, he loved his selfish ambition, he loved his greed, he loved his position, and when things weren't working out, he was easy to make a deal to get out of it. And if you allow sin in your life and you don't deal with it, the Bible says you are giving yourself a location for the devil. Ephesians 4 says, do not be, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sin go down in your anger, um, nor give place or opportunity for the devil. If you don't deal with sin, you are literally opening your door up and saying, okay, Satan, you can never take my eternal life, but you can go ahead and ravage the rest of me. You can take me and destroy me and make me useless for Christ on this earth. I know you can't take my salvation, but go ahead and take everything else. Clean, out, clean house, Satan. That is what we're doing. I beg you, do not 
do not trifle with sin. Do not play with sin. Do not just think it's no big deal. It is a big deal. It is a great deal. And the world will convince you that talking about sin is old-fashioned and it's not an issue for today. And I beg to differ. Sin is dangerous. One sin left unchecked is dangerous. Judas at any time could have humbled himself, but he didn't. He allowed his unchecked, tolerated sin to grow into hardness, not only motivated by Satan, but finally indwelt by Satan. And again, it did not happen overnight. If you ever feel indifferent to Christ, if you ever feel like it's just not a big deal anymore, you're in danger. But can I say this? There's always time for repentance. There's always time, as we sang, to bow the knee, to humble yourself, and to believe in the one who holds eternity. See, there's ne it's never too late. Even while Judas is fashioning a noose out of a cord, he finds some rope, he ties a, a noose, he goes out to the Valley of Gehenna, he sees a nice tree with its branches going over the cliff. He takes the other end of the rope and ties it on the branch, puts the noose around his neck, tightens it, and he just jumps off. I really think until the very moment he jumped off and ended his life, he could have returned to the Lord. Maybe it was too late by then. Maybe judicially God would not allow that. But it's tragic, isn't it? It's tragic that somebody could see the glory of Christ, hear the greatness of Christ, experience his, his kindness, his words, watch his actions, and never see a fault, never see a flaw, and never believe. Wow. I'm grateful that we can be here tonight because this is a softening experience. This is a responding time. And this is a time when we can think now for the week. Wow. Wow. I, I'm going to guard my heart. I'm not going to let sin go unchecked. I'm not going to tolerate sin. I'm going to deal with it. I will confess it. I will deal, deal with it. I will, I will find help, get accountability. I will return to the Lord. I will humble myself. And I will draw near to the presence of God and have him change me. This is a good time for that. We see now, as we continue the rest of the, the text, these next five chapters, Judas is gone. The authorities are coming. But before the authorities get to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is going to unload his heart to the disciples. And I'm going to walk you through the upper room discourse, starting with a little introduction next Sunday morning that goes into all of the things that Jesus is setting his disciples up. Because again, they have no idea he's going to die. They're not thinking that at all. So everything he says to them, they're like, we don't get it. It doesn't make sense. And Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will remind you of all these things that I declared to you. And we have it recorded for us. What a blessing. If you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes. Listen, church. Listen, faith family. I love you. And I'm thankful that you're here. And I want you to stand before Jesus Christ at the reward seat, and I want him to smile and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my joy. Rich are your rewards. Your faithfulness on earth will produce abundant blessing in eternal life. I want you laden with blessing and reward in the future. But it's up to you to respond. It's up to you to be with the Lord intimately, walking with him day by day. Do not follow the way of the world or those who have gone away from the faith, departed, saying, what is the use to serve the Lord? Don't do that. I beg you, draw near to the Lord and he will draw near to you. So if you are not a believer, Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead. Apart from any religion or good works, you can trust him and have eternal life. As a believer, don't tolerate sin. 
but let your heart be changed, transformed into his image. With every song that we sing, with every prayer that is prayed, with every text we read, with every scripture that is taught, respond and say, Lord, I want this. I, I want this intimacy with you. I want to walk with you in the light as you are in the light. I will forsake my sin. I will confess my sin. I beg you um, to consider that. I can tell you that's where the joy, the peace, and the blessing will come. Father, thank you for this text. It is tragic and it is sorrowful that one who is so close to Christ, one who ate with him, received the sop from Jesus, listened to his teaching, held up a basket of bread fragments from a miracle on a hillside. He watched the lame walk. Judas watched the blind get their sight back. He watched the dead son of the widow at Nain rise from the dead, and he could not believe. He did not believe. He would not believe. This man forsook every opportunity to come to Christ. And I pray that we would not do that. I pray that we would run to Christ, that we would pursue him and thirst for his word and thirst for righteousness, that we would deal with our sin and not allow it, not tolerate it, but our lives, our hearts, our minds would be transformed so that you could use us for your glory and honor because you are so worthy, you are so great, and we are nothing without you. Father, I pray we would realize this and you would strengthen this church because of it. And as a result of men and women, boys and girls, dealing with their sin, living holy, righteous, blameless lives, pursuing you in prayer, that you would bless this assembly and allow the gospel message to go powerfully into our community, surrounding area, and even through the world. Awaken our hearts, Father. Awaken our minds and our hearts to the glory of Christ. Let us not be indifferent, lukewarm, or complacent to spiritual things. Thank you, Father, for the reminder of Judas and his evil deeds. Thank you for the warning it gives us. We love our Savior, and we want to serve him by loving one another. Thank you, Father, for this evening and the worship and praise to our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory now and forever. Amen.